Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Amy Williamson. I am the Deputy Director of the Iowa Department of Education. So glad to see you all. Um, chairs are almost all full. It's a great turnout for today. Um, I have the privilege of introducing this morning the Director of the Department of Education, Dr. Ian Lebo. Um, director Lebo was appointed as Director of the Iowa Department of Education in March of 2020. And so I think all of us remember what was happening in March of 2020. Um, if you don't, uh, Anne was actually appointed on the day uh, that all of us at the Iowa Department of Education were told to go home uh, because we were having a pandemic and we didn't realize at the time uh, exactly how serious that would be and how long it would be before we got to come back to the office and see each other again. And I think that was probably the case for many of you as well. So um, Dr. Lebo has had an interesting ride uh, as the director of the Department of Education, to say the least. Uh, she previously served as the executive director of the Iowa Board of Educational Examiners. Uh, she was also Iowa's chief talent officer for the Council of Chief State School Officers. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the Council of Chief State School Officers or CCSSO, it is a national organization that organizes states um, around important issues in education. And so um, it has been a pleasure for Iowa to have uh, Anne serving in that role as well. Prior to her work at the state level, Dr. Lebo uh, was a secondary principal in Grundy Center. Um, she was an adjunct faculty member in education and leadership at Waldorf University. So um, I was also at Waldorf University and we just nearly missed each other there, right? Um, she was an athletic coach and an English instructor at the secondary and post-secondary level for 17 years. Um, she also worked in the private sector for five years. Anne served on the statewide teacher leadership and compensation task force in 2012, and she was also appointed to the governor's STEM advisory council in 2017. So she's done so much in education for the state of Iowa, um, and we are uh, lucky to have her as our director of education uh, now for the state of Iowa. So um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ann Lebo. Well, good morning uh, and welcome to the first ever Iowa Best Behavioral, Equitable, Social Emotional, Trauma Informed Health in Schools Summit. And I have to say, as Amy and I were walking up here, I am just overwhelmed and astounded and thrilled with the turnout today. To see all of you here today focused on the goal, um, our shared goal of addressing mental health and the concerns we know that has brought to us, uh, particularly over this past year. Um, it is tremendously humbling and exciting to have all of you here today. So welcome. Um, I would like to give a special thanks to some people who have helped made this, this event a success. Uh, thank you to the team at the department. Thank you to our team members and partners at the University of Iowa. Um, I would like to particularly single out Dean Clay and Deputy Director Amy Williamson for championing this idea and bringing this to the table. You know, we are at a unique and pivotal point in how we can address mental health. This past year has um, brought to the forefront the concerns we knew already existed. And right now, because of our shared and common goal and the opportunity to have some additional funds to spearhead some of this work, we have this uh, we are here today. And so we're excited to see that we can kick off this event and thrilled that all of you are here to be partners in this work. Over the next few days, you will hear from um, a keynote address from Dr. Renee Bradley with the U.S. Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs, and Dr. Jacob Priest, Associate Professor and Director of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at the University of, Wa of Iowa. We have a lot of partners here today, a wide range of programs. Um, we've seen a lot of teams coming here today to learn from different groups and go back and share that work. And we look forward to the opportunities that you have to bring this work back into to your schools. Yesterday at the pre-conference uh, summit, 
you know, we had the opportunity to look at all the partners at the table, and we believe we have an unprecedented opportunity to bring everyone together and drive this work forward. Never before have we had everybody at the same table on the same page. And for us to make this work and to champion this work and understand how we can all work together, for the first time, really, I believe we will be able to make a difference in mental health in our state. So, uh, with that being said, I tend to go off script, so I'm sorry, Heather, but I'd like to uh, uh, start to talk about, you know, the opportunities we have today. So, because um, we're here today, I'd like to thank everybody and give a loud round of applause for everybody who helped make this day a success. So, thank you for being here um, and appreciate all your partnerships in this important work, and I hope you enjoy the next two days. Good morning, my name is Allison Brune and I am the Executive Director of the Iowa Center for School Mental Health and I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote today. As we were brainstorming ideas on who to give the keynote, Renee was one of the first people that came to mind because of her vast array of work as a special educator serving students with emotional and behavioral disorders and her extensive leadership related to research policy and practice at the federal level. I asked Renee what she wanted me to say about her today, and she said she didn't like long introductions and not to read her bio. Um, so you can check it out in the Sketch app and read about how amazing she is. I have had the pleasure of getting to know her through her work as the project officer for the National Center for Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. And through that, I have learned that not only is she brilliant, she is also an avid, co avid college football fan and a rock star at karaoke. So don't be alarmed if she starts singing and dancing. Um, but beyond her brilliance, she is just an incredibly kind and generous person dedicated to making a difference in kids' lives. And when we asked her to do this, she immediately said yes, and that just kind of speaks to her generosity. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Renee Bradley. That's a horrible noise. So let's do this again. Good morning. Thank you. So um, during COVID, I've been really working on um, noticing small things that I uh, get to accomplish because you know, I felt like I was kind of slugging through this time warp over the last 18 months. I'm sure nobody can identify with that. So um, today, I'm really happy to say that I don't have sweatpants and tennis shoes behind this podium. Um, I've only been dressing from the waist up for the last 18 months. This is my first in-person experience. Um, so uh, if I kick off my shoes or, or have sore feet or um, any of the above, uh, please excuse me because um, y'all are my first trial run at a real audience again. I love the name of this conference, don't y'all? Yes? You know what, they did that on purpose. It's built in PR because we're gonna go home in the next couple of days and people are gonna go, where were you? And we're gonna say, we were at the best conference, right? <laughs> We're gonna say that so they know that next year they're gonna to have to get a room twice this size because um, everybody's gonna uh, want to come to the best conference. Thanks for joining this morning. Uh, we're all juggling a lot of things and um, thanks to all of you that chose to be here um, and thanks to all of you that were voluntold you were gonna be here. Um, if you're in the latter group, it's gonna be much better than you expected. Um, and I also uh, want to ask you, and I'm horrible at this, so I'm asking you to do something I'm not super successful with. I want to ask you to give yourself the freedom and the permission to absorb and reflect and learn over the next couple of days and value that you're sitting next to people that share what you are here to do. 
to improve services for children and youth in the area of social, emotional, and behavioral, and mental health. We've been trying to be more cognizant of these um, mini celebration um, moments. And I, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example real quick. And see, I'm going off script, just like our, um, our director did earlier, Dr. Lebo. But uh, do you ever notice that um, I have a 15-year-old son that's really into cars? And he will say, oh, there's so many orange cars. And I'm like, Gibson, I don't see that many orange cars on the road. And he'll say, yeah, mom, there are tons of orange cars these days. And what happens the next day I'm driving? All I see is orange cars, right? Has that ever happened to you? So what people put in our heads and what we're looking for is often what we see. So as we go back to school, as you start, well, you've been back for a while, but as we continue on this journey of improving services for children and youth, think about what we're looking for. Because a lot of times what we're looking for is exactly what we see. So if we're looking for the best in children and teachers and providers, that's what we're gonna see. And that's gonna give us such a leg up on how we can build our pathway forward. How many of you attended um, the PBIS virtual forum that was held last week? Okay, good. So um, please don't run out right now. You are gonna hear a couple of things that I shared um, last week if you tuned into that um, talk, but I've um, tried my best to customize it to some of the great things that you're doing in Iowa. So I'm going to spend the first half of my time going through the recommendations from a new document from the Department of Education that was released two weeks ago today. Um, and it is, I've been there for 24 years, and it's probably the document I'm most proud of that the document is released, that the department's released in that time period. I got to serve on a work group that was part of it. As many of you know here, the mental health and social emotional behavioral challenges are not new, nor are they just the result of COVID. The mental health concerns of our children and youth have been recently brought to a, a light. Um, there's definitely more attention on this issue um, since COVID. And there seems to be a new urgency um, to address the issue that many of us have been working on for many years. So the new document is called Supporting Child and Student Social, Emotional, Behavioral, and Mental Health Needs. And it's part of the United States um, uh, roadmap to recovery that's been um, put out from the department. When I talk today, I'm gonna to forget to use my clicker, I'm sorry. There we go. When I um, speak today, uh, there are lots of definitions about mental health, and I'm sure you might have one in your um, regional um, network or um, in your state. But uh, for the purposes of the document and for the purposes of how I'm gonna refer to mental health today, I'm gonna to use the CDC definition. And it says, mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. Think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others, and make healthy choices. In the United States, we are pretty lucky. I got to talk to a group of other countries a couple of two weeks ago, right as the document had been released, about mental health as a global crisis. And it truly is a topic for every country around the globe right now. Right now, we have a Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, who believes strongly in the importance of prioritizing social, emotional, and behavioral and mental health needs of children and youth to fully enable them to participate in learning and a full range of opportunities. The quote on the left, he said last March, I don't usually read quotes, but I am going to read a couple today. In the past, student access to structured mental health services in schools hasn't been implemented in a functional way. It's been ancillary and after the fact. We have an opportunity now to redesign schools and make sure that mental health services are a core part of the school's DNA. I love 
that last part of that statement, a core part of the school's DNA. In releasing the document, he said that our efforts as educators must go beyond literacy, math, history, science, and other core subjects to include helping students build the social, emotional, and behavior skills they will need to fully access and participate in learning and make the most of their potential future opportunities. This is a link to the document, um, and these slides will be up for your um, access. Uh, in the document, it, it's fairly lengthy, um, but the first 34-ish pages um, explore the challenges that we are all very, very aware of. Um, and then it looks through the seven recommendations, which I'm gonna share with you today. Uh, it has implementation examples, which we worked real hard to make sure that we had a variety of examples so folks see a recommendation. And then in the appendix, there are lots of different examples of how different states and districts and schools across the country are implementing them. It also includes a list of federally supported technical assistance centers across the Department of Education and HHS and a, a list of resources that are hyperlinked for you to use. So I, I really encourage you, con considering the great effort that I was putting into this topic area, to look at this resource and, and use it as you see fit. So I'm gonna walk through um, the recommendations, talk to you a little bit about what we were thinking about. Um, when we um, put them together, uh, a few of the examples that we've shared of practice, and then I'm gonna do a little extra touch um, for you today. I, I've sent out some little spies into Iowa. Um, I, hope, um, I hope they've done a justice um, to reporting back uh, examples where you're already doing this. And that's what I want you to take away with from this, and I'm gonna say that at the end of my talk you've got a really strong foundation to build on. So I'm gonna call these backyard examples because a lot of times we don't know what's going on in our own backyard. And I think it's important that you know that you have colleagues and expertise right here in Iowa that can help you work on some of these um, recommendations as you go forward. So the first one looks at prioritizing wellness for each and every child, student, educator, and provider. And this document initially was about how we support children and youth. And so initially on this one, we thought about it's prioritizing wellness for every child and youth. And one of the things we realized in the initial steps of the document, the most important thing we can do to prioritize wellness of children and youth is to first prioritize the wellness of our teachers and providers. Thanks. And I'm gonna talk more about that um, towards the end of, of my talk. But we need to focus on the importance of how school and program leaders support and show concern for their staff and students. Examples include building relationships, which we know is a, a core thing that we have to work on with our students. But our leaders of programs and schools also have to work on that with our teachers to have a relationship with teachers just like we would build relationship with our students. We look at uh, knowing the names, knowing something about them, knowing something about what makes them tick, what they think is important. Just like we do for our children and our youth, we should be doing that for our teachers and providers. When we look at per, um, extending this whole child, traditionally what we think of um, educating the whole child, beyond academics. In Solon High School, um, I think it was the beginning of this year, they had, is Solon High School, do we have anyone here? All right, so I'm tooting your horn a little bit. Um, they held a student SEL conference, uh, sharing information and strategies, such as time management, mindfulness, resiliency, sleep, handling anxiety, and guess who it was for? The students. It was a student conference. They had student voice, they gave students ideas about how to do this. I wish my son's high school did this, right? Because the thing we struggle with the most if, with him, he's, he does well academically. It's how to study, why sleep's important, 
why game uh, Xbox is not as important. But uh, these are great skills that this high school took to share with each of their students as, um, as they started the year. The next priority looks at enhancing mental health literacy and reducing stigma and other barriers to access. A key word in this one that I'd like you to notice is that we don't say mental health awareness. We say mental health literacy. So what's the difference there? Because we're asking folks to go beyond just awareness. It's not enough just to know what the signs are. It's not enough to just know um, some social, emotional, behavioral, mental health techniques and strategies that we can use. We need to build literacy in this topic area just like we would in an academic area. Now, does everyone have to have the same degree of literacy? No. Some folks just need to have a basic level of um, literacy. And then there are others on the other end of that continuum that need to be experts in that area because those are the folks we will go to when we need to support the kids with the most intensive needs. So this talks about the importance of integrated services and making them readily available. Where else can we make them readily available than in the school or the program setting? There's also some evidence that's showing us that, and educators get upset when we say treatment sometimes, but treatment or services that are provided in the school or program setting are more likely to be followed through with by the students, the children, and the families. Why? Because it's easier to access, right? They're already there. So why don't we work more fully on bringing the services into the setting where they already are? The other thing is they're more likely to ask for help, especially if they see these providers part of the school community. They're not an outsider coming in. They're not a new face they've never seen. It's someone who is integrated into their full school community. <clears throat> in doing this, we have the opportunity to kind of normalize access to social, emotional, behavioral, and mental health services. There are lots of really effective um, mental health PR campaigns going on. I live in Northern Virginia, and I um, am amazed every time I see new um, ads on. That's not always been the case. I know firsthand it's really hard to get services for a child in an emergency situation. That should not be the case. So how do we normalize access, and how do we make it more readily available? I'm going to talk about a private um, organization partnership with schools and communities, and, um, uh, and I, I want to share this as an example of how you can access community partnerships and um, build Please Pass the Love, which I, I'm sure most, most of you know because it's from here. They had a great campaign on Stomp Out Stigma. You know, the whole purpose of that was to look at, you know, mental health needs should not be looked at as a, a, a weakness or broken or um, it should be looked at just the same way that we look at a child who's unable to uh, immediately be successful in a math class or a world history or a French one. Backyard examples, besides the community um, connection with Please Pass the Love, um, they, uh, Iowa has been the recipient of federal grants in mental health first aid, um, and those are directly related to the effort that we're here to talk about today. And Iowa, I heard, is working on extending services through virtual access and using um, telehealth. We all know that we would prefer, most of us, it's all is not true in this statement, most of us would prefer to be in person, um, but sometimes that's not possible, either because you are, might be in a rural environment where services are not readily available and you need a level of expertise that doesn't exist in your community or school. It might be because you have a student that has needs that a lot, that, that student that he or she needs to um, have more of a, a virtual connection um, with providers. So again, great examples of where Iowa is moving in the right direction. The third one is implementing a continuum of evidence-based practices. So a couple of things here. Continuum, it's services that range from less intensive to more intensive. What we provide to all children, youth, teachers, providers. 
and then more intensive, what we provide to those that need our best and most. So along that continuum, and if we're deliberate about truly having that continuum, then we can say that we're providing services for all students. A, having a continuum where you can differentiate services based on needs. The second point here is evidence-based practice. One th another learn we had from this past 18 months is how precious our time is. We don't have the time or the resources to spend on things that we are not sure are gonna work, are not gonna lead to the outcomes that we value and are working towards. So making sure that we spend our time and energy on what we know works. In focusing on these, it prepares us to address a full range of learners, those most impacted by risk, like trauma, poverty, as well as those with disabilities or other learning challenges, those that might come from rural environments, those that may not have two parents in their house, those that lost a grandparent or a parent during COVID. So we truly put a range of services in place that can address the full range of student needs. The State Department's new clearinghouse on evidence-based practices and resources, what a great resource for y'all as uh, teachers and providers. I hope they didn't start from scratch. I hope they looked at some of the other great resources that are available um, in clearinghouses, but putting those practices together in one spot so you don't have to go digging and hunting for them when you need it quickly, that's a great service. Cedar Rapids has incorporated social emotional practices into all of their high school as a deliberate part of instruction. Two backyard examples. Recommendation four, establish an integrated framework of educational, social, emotional, behavioral, and mental health supports for all. This is what I have focused on my entire professional career. How do we create safe, positive, predictable learning environments where kids, where children and youth can be successful, where teachers and providers can be successful? And a lot of times we don't think, a lot of times we'll say safe and we don't say positive. A lot of times we say safe and positive. The word predictable is really important too because what do we want to do? We want to set folks up for success where it be children or youth or teachers or providers. What's expected of you? What do we want you, how do we want you to behave and function in this environment? And then what are the supports and services that are there to help you be successful? That's what we all want to do. It also talks about um, uh, the importance of leadership teams. How many of you have leadership teams at your schools? How many of you have too many leadership teams at your schools? Okay, we don't really need to add another leadership team. We need to look at, is there an existing team? Is there a team that we can expand the scope a little bit? There are lots of teams going on in schools right now that really fall under one umbrella of social, emotional, behavioral, and mental health. I don't really care what you, I have preferences, but I don't really care what you call that umbrella but we need to organize those teams so that they are functional and efficient, both for the teachers and for the outcomes that they produce. So next time you hear your principal or your you know, program lead say, we're gonna start another team on this, say, would it make sense to incorporate into this team, all right? Fewer teams gives us a, a smaller folk area of focus, right? Integrate into how schools and programs function. Integrate it into the DNA of schools. So addressing social, emotional, behavioral support is not something we do when we have time. It's not something we do the first two minutes of every day. It's something that's integrated into how we deliver. And we don't do something specific to a kid. Those structures of MTSS or those frameworks, they help us as the adults organize our practices to know what we're supposed to do as adults in that environment. And the thing I like most about 
the majority of the frameworks and organization structures that are out there is that they allow for you to be to customize and have flexibility. If you're looking at a framework that says you must do this, this, and this across the different tiers, that framework might not be the best one for you to look at. Because I guarantee you, and you know this, every school's not the same, every program's not the same, every kid's not the same, every group of teachers and providers is not the same. We need the ability to customize, truly customize to meet children's needs. So when you're looking at a framework for organizing your practices um, and coming up with a structure of what you need, make sure that you have the flexibility to customize that to what? Your environment, your school, your kids. That's the beauty of these frameworks. Backyard examples. Iowa's MTSS action planning, um, what a great foundation to look at delivering a continuum of multi-tiered supports. I really was impressed with the kind of self-assessment of implementation. And we all need that, right? If there are lots of steps in something, don't we all need to know how we're doing on, on doing those steps? Which steps are we not doing well? Which steps have we yet to implement? So you really got a strong structure there. Grantwood and North East AEAs are using an interconnected systems framework to integrate mental health practices and supports. Um, they have regional uh, coaches that are targeting, targeting um, support to teachers and providers. They're looking at using PBIS and interconnected system framework tools uh, to support the teachers and help them with self-assessments. Liberty High School, anybody? Are these real schools here? I hope my elves have given me real examples. Okay, so uh, Liberty High School, even with an increase in student numbers, saw a decrease in office discipline referrals and suspensions. So just telling me that, I'm like, oh good, but what? And they did the but what? They had a decrease in office discipline referrals and suspension, and they paired that with improvements in graduation rate. I love how they paired that with an outcome that we, that we value, right? Graduation rate is our end result. We want kids to graduate from schools with the skills that they have to go on and be successful. So pairing a, a reduction of office discipline referrals and suspensions, that's when we're excluding kids from learning environment. Ah, if we let them stay in the learning environment, guess what happens? They tend to learn more. It's amazing. If they're there in the class, they tend to learn more. So I love how they paired that together. Um, Iowa also had, and I'm not sure, I didn't have time to look if, um, if you have them in this round, but I know in the um, first round of uh, school climate transformation grants, you had both a state grant and uh, um, two district ones uh, that were focused on um, SEL competencies. And um, also Waterloo has been uh, involved in a Project AWARE grant, AWARE grant that's focusing on family engagement. So I hope that you're seeing, we've got a couple more, those were the major ones, a couple one more to go through, but I hope you're seeing something really important here. These are national recommendations that we're looking at in this area, and this is just a snapshot of things you're already got going on, okay? So I hope, you're, I hope you feel good about where you're positioned. The next one is leveraging policy and funding. Don't we all wish there was a treasure chest somewhere with unlimited amounts of money? Um, there's not a treasure chest, but this year there is more money than we have had in the past for a very long time. Uh, schools, districts, and states do have substantial amounts of money coming in to help them um, recover from the uh, COVID pandemic. And a dedicated use, focused use of those funds are on social emotional behavioral and uh, mental health needs. There are also lots of different funding streams even before these last um, set. I'm not saying that they are adequate in any way, shape, or form. But I am saying that I have seen some states, and it's hard to get them to come forward and step up um, and share these examples, but some states have been more creative and flexible and collaborative with how they use their funds. In the pre-conference last night, I 
I heard an example of someone that because they had been in another area, um, they knew of a, um, a resource, a support resource, a person of expertise that could help with kids with more intensive needs. If they didn't know about that earlier, they wouldn't have known to ask for it. So look at creative ways to use your funding to kind of focus your um, efforts on, on what you most value. The other area is to look at our policies. The thing we're pretty good about is making up new policies, right? I mean, we do that at the federal level, it happens at the, at the state level, it happens at your district level, it happens at your school level, some teachers have policies, so you've got policies on top of policies on top of policies. Policies are important to support progress, but you also want to look at your existing policies. Why? Because some of our older policies may actually be hindering our current progress. Are there some policies that need to be changed in order to support how you're moving forward in your change of thinking? And I'll refer back to that in a few minutes. The other thing that we talk about in this um, recommendation is to highlight our successes. We as educators aren't great at tooting our own horn. And I'm not sure why, but we're, that's not something that comes naturally to a lot of educators. We have to get better at highlighting our successes. Amplifying the how, how you did something that worked out great so that others can follow your path and not have to recreate the wheel. The wheel. And this is also an opportunity for us to work with our media. You know, the, the media is extremely powerful. Wouldn't it be great if we could get the media to focus on more success stories, the good things that are happening in schools for teachers, for families, for students, instead of the things that appear to be more challenging in public? In your um, backyard, great things you're already doing. Uh, their um, Iowa relief funds have been dedicated to assist in um, coming back from uh, COVID pandemic. This new center today that's hosting this event the Iowa Center on School Mental Health, uh, the partnership between the State Department and the University of Iowa, that's something that we keep saying over and over again, use the expertise there, build partnerships and collaboration. I'm definitely gonna share this up the chain is a, a, a great example of that. Um, Governor Reynolds, when uh, uh, she talked about the um, the new center in June said that she wants to prepare schools and teachers to meet the behavioral and mental health needs of Iowa's K-12 students and provide the tools they need. I was so happy that she deliberately included the word behavior in there. It's really important when we talk about social, emotional, and mental health to include behavioral health in that terminology, in that string. And I know it makes it a lot longer, but the primary reason most children are excluded from the learning environment is because of their behaviors. Now, I would posit that it's probably unaddressed social, emotional, or mental health needs that are resulting in those behaviors, but they're excluded primarily because their behaviors are inconsistent with the school or program expectations. So having that focus on behavior is critically important because we need to be deliberate about teaching children how to meet the expectations in given environments. I can guarantee you that I would not sing karaoke up here as um, Allison referred to earlier um, because it's not the environment to do karaoke. And I have learned that from making mistakes in the past. No, I'm teasing. but. Um, <laughs> Uh, we need to, we can learn how to behave appropriately in different environments. So thanks, uh, your governor, and I am going to get uh, Dr. Lebo in a minute with a quote, but um, your leadership is, is here to do what you want to do. Um, and, and that is, uh, that is a, a big plus in your corner. So take advantage of that. Next is enhancing workforce capacity. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this um, in the next segment. But what we're looking at here is, do we have the right people in the right places doing the right things? That's what we want to kind of focus on. 
how do we allocate, how do school leaders or program leaders allocate the time of their teachers and staff in the building? How are teachers and providers given access to coaching and more intensive expertise if they need it? How do we increase the number of providers that are available? How do we use the time of expertise more efficiently? If we are lucky enough to have a social worker, a dedicated social worker in our school, that person's time should be spent working with teachers, children, students, and families, not doing administrative tasks. So how do we allocate the time of the expertise that's in our building? How do we attract and retain people to this profession? And I'll come back to this in a little while. But how do we attract and retain people in this profession? It is not the desired profession that it once was, and that's unfortunate. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in a, little, in a few minutes. And then how do we have um, time and dedicated resources to coaching? Coaching should not be something that is just provided in certain areas or that only a few teachers get. Every teacher in every building and program should have access to coaching. When they have a tough, a tough kid or a tough relationship or a tough situation in their school, we don't need to just say, well, you handle it. You're the teacher. It's your classroom. We need to support them just like we would support students. So how do we really implement and integrate coaching as a typical part of how we address workforce capacity? What's going on great in your own backyard? Um, the Iowa State Department of Education is increasing providers through a therapeutic grant program. There is um, an OSEP grant uh, from the office I work in that's looking at increasing special educators in school psychs. Um, to address intensive needs of students. There may or may not be a, a little card in your bag that you might want to look at if you're interested in attending that. See, there's your plug. Someone asked me for that plug. Uh, here in Des Moines, there's an initiative to lower the school counselor rate down um, to 250 to 1, which is the more recommended, um, instead of 417 to 1. Think about that. How can we expect one person to connect with 417 kids in a, in a substantive, substantive way? Before school, there was a professional de development conference for um, school counselors in the area to make sure that they were geared up and supported for addressing the things that were going to occur throughout this year. And um, as was already mentioned earlier, you've got the access to the new eight-part webinar series on increasing mental health literacy that the center is going to provide. The last recommendation is the use of data for decision making to promote equitable implementation outcomes. Are we included a collection of social, emotional, behavior, and mental health outcomes in our data systems and our school dashboards? Just like we look at academic indicators, are we looking at social, emotional, and behavioral indicators? It's amazing that I've seen some um, dashboards where they're actually using data on child progress from like third through seventh grade to predict what kind of supports and services that they're going to need in um, high school in order to be successful. That's a really neat use of data, because you can pretty much predict who are going to be the kids that are going to be successful and who are going to be the ones that are going to need a little bit more to meet that outcome. It also talks about the importance of having accessible and user-friendly and readily available data. How many of you have consistent access to data on social, emotional, behavioral, and mental health indicators in your school on a daily basis? You can punch a button and have access to it. So that's a problem. That's an area where you might want to work on. Because when we look at data in a crisis moment, our decisions about children, youth, teachers, or providers is never going to be as wonderful as if we look at uh, data that gives us a pattern over time. So how are we using data in a way that we can make database decisions about children's social, emotional, behavioral, and mental health needs? 
This also talks about universal screening um, to uh, include, just like we do for a lot of kindergartners and third graders, that we look at some universal um, screening protocols. And it also looks at the importance of sharing data with your community, your families, um, so they understand both what you're doing in your school and why, what the data says about your local school and community. You're really fortunate to have the Iowa Conditions for Learning Survey because the data that you're asking for there speaks to a lot of the issues that we're going to talk about um, over the next couple of days together. But how do you continue to make data more accessible and user-friendly and immediate in these areas of social, emotional, and behavioral um, and mental health outcomes? OK. Take a breath. We're going to spend the next 10 minutes talking about some um, different things, some messages for you to carry away with, OK? Um, and I want you to just allow yourself a few seconds to reflect, to think. Just sit for a few seconds. Give yourself that time. And I'm going to step away from my, my kind of role at the Department of Education um, and talk to you as a teacher, a person who cares deeply about children that often get left out of conversations, um, and someone who spent the last 40, 34, God, I'm making myself older than I am, uh, 34 years uh, working to make schools a better place for more children, and mostly as a parent of two teenage children. So there are so many challenges that our children and youth and families face regarding um, social, emotional, and mental health. We have to take care of ourselves. Have to take care of ourselves, right? But we also are called on to take care of others and not just this children and students. I'm really worried about our teachers and providers. And I know many of you are teachers and providers in the audience today. We are so focused on our children and students that we're often forgetting to focus on our teachers and providers. We've experienced a huge uh, retirement wave before COVID and COVID has made the conditions even worse. I bet even some of you that are in the classroom are thinking about this might be my last year or I'm not going to do this for five more years or 10 more years. And the scary thing is we don't have people in the pipeline coming up to take your place. Our most valuable change agent, regardless of what we talk about in our systems and our structures and our policies, is that interaction between that teacher and provider and that student. And we have to prioritize supporting there. We need to all do a better job taking care of ourselves, but it's critical that we prioritize taking care of our profession, which is really suffering, and we take care of our teachers that are here. We've got to keep our teachers here. The best way we can do that is to provide the same support to them that we advocate for and provide um, to our students. I'm reminded of a quick meme that someone sent me recently, and it's, it looks like a teenage or young person, and they, um, they type, they say, mom, please come get me from school. And the response from mom is, Megan, you are the teacher. <laughs> so it's funny, but it's also a serious commentary on, um, on, on where we are. The next thing I want to talk to a little bit is about connections and relationships. For me, this is one of the most important priorities. Evidence-based practices and data are critical, but they're not sufficient. If we don't have those connections, those connections with our students, those connections with our colleagues, those connections with our leaders, those connections are valuable and critical to our, um, our forward uh, progress. I listened to a session last week, and someone said connections before content. And I not really kind of thought about that before, but when he said it, I was like, oh man, I'm totally stealing that. So I've stolen it and I've shared it with you today, okay? Connections before content. We have to have that, that um, group connection. I'm a big Brene Brown fan. I don't know if anyone listens to her, um, but I especially like her definition of connections. She says it's the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued. 
when they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. So that's an important question for us to ask ourselves. Do our efforts, both collectively and individually, support and strengthen the protective factors that our children and students need to develop and strengthen? I'm always thinking about what if every kid felt connected, seen, and wanted in a school program or classroom? If they just felt like they belonged there and somebody wanted them to be there, the outcomes that we could accomplish would be exponential. I'm skipping forward a little bit because I've gotten my, um, my, uh, my clue over here. Thank you. Uh, I'm also reading another book about um, the high five habit. Has anyone heard of this book? So I've been a big fan of high fives for a long time. I think if you play sports that you have some kind of high fives, you do it, you know, guys, you know, slap each other, but you know, a lot of the girls sports, you go up high. Um, and uh, uh, I didn't know some of the research associated with this. So I, I love how she, um, that she's um, written about um, this book. Mel Robbins is the author. She says it's a transfer of energy, a reminder of something good, an awakening, a sign of I believe in you. It's beyond our self-talk. It, it triggers physical response in a positive way. It demonstrates a celebration with someone else. There's even a study on NBA teams, and it looks at the number of high fives they give each other in practice and their win ratio. And guess what? It's positive. So I wonder if this is a kind of a new habit we need to pick up um, with our kids. Remember the teacher in Tennessee that got a lot of national news for having a different um, handshake or um, a welcome with each individual student? So I'm not sure if that is a good, that was a long time to get all those kids in the classroom, but high fives quick. Um, maybe it's a habit we need to look at. Dr. Lebo said, ensuring students feel supported is critical to their overall well-being and academic achievement. Another example of leadership where you have an advantage um, over some other um, uh, states and districts because your leaders are really behind you in working on this. Whoops, back. Last one. I have a domino on my desk at work, at school. I carry one in my backpack. I was gonna have it up here to show you. It's down in my um, bag. But I wanna talk to you a little bit, really quickly on the ending about a domino. And I wish I could like hand one out to each of you today. So try to go home and rummage through your stuff. Everyone has dominoes in their cabinet somewhere. It reminds me of sage advice I once got from a dear friend and mentor. Focus on the smallest thing you can do to get the biggest impact. It's become a daily mantra for me during COVID and one I hope to continue. What can I do to make a difference? Sometimes it's a small note or a hug or buying someone a coffee in the car behind you. Sometimes it's asking a teacher, what can I do to support your efforts? Sometimes it's large, like advocating for a big policy change. The domino also reminds me to erase the notion that I can't change things, that I'm too far down the chain or too far down the ladder to have real substantial impact on chain. We can't change or control everything, but we can in every day, in different ways, do something to make a difference. And if you haven't seen the videos, I encourage you to go online. Always remember that a tiny little domino placed in the right place can create enough energy to topple buildings and be astounding. In closing, the quote I shared from Secretary Cardona in to begin ends with saying, we need to prioritize social, emotional, and mental health if we want to see academic success. I want us to be able to support social, emotional, behavioral, and mental health development just as we do academics. When children and youth don't meet our SEB and mental health expectations, we need to recognize the need for more support and instruction 
not blame, exclusion, or isolation. We don't remove students for failing a reading expectation or test. We reteach, we practice, we guide, we provide extra time. We need to look at social, emotional, and behavioral needs in this, and, and failures in the same way. I'm gonna end with two final quotes. My title had some two little words in there, why now? It's not just that we need it more than we have needed it in the past, but it's that we know a lot about how to make things better than they are. Maya Angelou has a famous quote that says, do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. We know better than we're doing right now. Iowa is poised to really do better. One last favorite book, The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse by Charlie Maxey. If you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend. In the book, it's a series of drawings and conversations. What's the bravest thing you've said? Asked the boy. Help, said the horse. Asking for help isn't giving up, said the horse. It's refusing to give up. How do we change the narrative going forward? That asking for help, whether it be a child, a youth, a teacher, a provider, is a show of great strength and never weakness. Do we have the strength and the will to be the right person doing the right thing at the right time? Because now we can't risk even one of our children or our teachers or providers not getting the support they need to realize their potential and take full advantage of the opportunities in front of them. Thank you for the time this morning. Take care of yourselves. Enjoy the conference, harness the energy of that little domino, and continue to be awesome. Have a great conference. And with that, I just want to uh, remind you all to check your sketch, uh, schedule uh, for your next session and that sessions are kind of spread out. So they're up here and then they're also down in Hy-Vee Hall. And so you may have to get around quite a bit to find your session. And then lunch is in Hy-Vee Hall in um, Room C, which is actually quite large, uh, and that'll start at 11.45, so we'll see you then, okay? Thanks.